Let's prepare our hearts for worship, if you will. If you haven't said good morning to the Father this morning, take the moment to do so. If you already have, then tell Him a midday hello, okay? And just sort of check in uh, with the Lord this morning. So if you will, just bow your heads in prayer as Donna helps prepare our hearts for worship. in all humbleness and gratitude. Let's read Scripture together, please. If you'll follow. Men, let's read. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Love of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done. He saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And that gives us reason to rejoice this morning. We bow down. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down. And we worship you, Lord, we bow down. And we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were King of the heavens before there was time, and King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king, we bow down and we crown you the king, we bow down and we crown you the king, king of all kings you will be. Praise the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus, He's my rock, He's my fortress, He's my deliverer, in Him will I trust, 
This is something to be happy about, okay? I know it's happy in your heart. Your face just doesn't know it yet. Pump that happiness up. Let's look like the words that we are singing and look like the joy that's within our hearts, please. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before the throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord of all the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Amen. Thank you. Well, it's great to be a citizen of the United States of America, isn't it? Many of us have that privilege, the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're proud of our liberty. We're proud of our freedom. We're proud that all of us have a right to vote. We're proud that all of us have a right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We're just proud of everything, aren't we? And yet we sing, we bow down before the Lord. How much against the grain of our national culture does our faith take us? For it is that attitude of humility before the Lord. It may be one of the most difficult things for citizens of such a powerful and prosperous nation. When was the last time that you physically got on your knees before God, physically acknowledging your humiliation before Him? When was the last time that you bowed not simply your knees, but you bowed your schedule and something that you really wanted to do, you laid aside that you might have a few minutes with Jesus? When was the last time that your life really was dictated, not by what you desired, not by what you really enjoyed, not by what was a dream or a goal, but by your complete dedication and servanthood before our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ? About five or six of us were able to crowd into the very little shop of a leather maker in another country. It's a country in which Christianity has a very small presence. He has but a fifth grade education. He heard the gospel through a radio broadcast in his language and gave his life to Jesus. He happened to connect with a British Christian who was also a Bible scholar. The British Christian knew Greek and Hebrew and he knew the language of his people, although he could not write it very well. The two of them working together produced a New Testament in the language of his people. And as we crowded into his little shop and met this precious believer, he told us how recently he had been asked every day for a month to report to the police station at 8 o'clock in the morning and spend the entire day there answering all kinds of questions and told at the end of the day to come back at 8 o'clock in the morning for a month every single day. When you make your living by what you physically work on with your hands and you lose all day, every day for a month, how do you think that affects your living? He bowed his knee before God. He bowed his lifestyle. He bowed his comfort. We sang, we bow down. But are you bent in the presence of God today. There are believers in this world who are serious about that phrase. May we be among them. 
I'm going to ask Dr. Jim Shaddix, our Dean of the Chapel, if he would come and join me here and lead us in a word of prayer. And as we begin this brand new semester, brand new year, full of promise and full of exciting opportunities, let us remember who's in charge. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, we sing about You and we preach about You and we, we talk about You and we study and read and learn about You. Lord, our prayer simply at the beginning of this semester is that all of our learning and all of our acknowledgement would find a very real place in our hearts that we might bow before You. Lord, protect us as we come into this new semester from busyness that would call us away from being before You in the quiet place. Remind us often, Lord, that in Mark chapter 1, after a very busy, busy day in Your life, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, you went out to a solitary place and there you prayed. Lord, may we be often and may we be unhurried before you as our King. And we pray that every step that we take and every word that we speak, every paper that we write, would be an act of submission to You. We honor You today, Lord, and we want to say we love You. We love You as our King, as our God, as our Savior. It's in Your precious name we pray. Amen. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you. Just remind them, work on the calluses. Would you do that? That's our goal for the year, bowing down before Him. Thank you so very much. It is a joy to have you with us for this time of worship on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. We welcome you to Level Chapel and a wonderful time to be in the presence of the Lord. Tomorrow begins our sermon series from our Dean of the Chapel for the spring semester. I've asked him if he will come and just share with you what God has laid on his heart to be sharing with us during this spring. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. In keeping with our emphasis this year on doctrinal integrity, in the fall we uh, looked at selected doctrines uh, and did some expositions on those, and I thought in the semester that it would be helpful for us to look to see how God takes some of those uh, teachings specifically in some of the, his, uh, the books that he's inspired and expands on them and fleshes them out. And so we're going to look at the book of Habakkuk one of the Old Testament prophets together under the umbrella of when God makes no sense. I don't know if you've encountered that in your life and ministry or not, but I certainly have. There's a lot of things that I can't figure out, but I'm very delighted that I'm able to serve a God that I can't figure out all of the time. But uh, Habakkuk took a journey from frustration to faith uh, in asking God some questions getting some responses, uh, not all of which were exactly what he was looking for, but all of them contributed to his development as a man of God and as a man of faith. And I trust it will be a challenge for us uh, this semester. Sounds great. Thank you, Dr. Shaddix. We'll look forward to that series beginning tomorrow. Is this the closest you've ever been to Jesus? The most exciting time in your spiritual life that you've ever had? If the answer is no, then you need to join me in praying for our time of campus revival that will be coming up in February. A time for us to look deeply into our hearts and to ask God, is there a deeper work that you need to do in my soul and in my life? Is there anything that is a hindrance to what you're planning to do? Is there another place that you want to take me in my understanding of your word and my intimacy with you? Campus revival will be coming soon. The key is, will revival be coming to my heart and to your heart? Dr. Don Wilson will be our preacher. You'll be hearing more about it as time goes by. But begin now in asking the Lord if he will take you back 
to the greatest time you've ever had in your intimacy with Him and show you He's got even more in store for you. Let's turn our hearts now towards worship. Good looking worship group today, but President Kelly, I sure hope we pick up a few more people before the end of the semester just so we can really, really come and worship the Lord, I tell you. Come thou fountain. Come thou fountain of every blessing. Turn thy heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, Hither by thy grace I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Interpose his precious blood. Here I raise my daily I'm time strained to be. Let that grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and feel it. Feel it for thy course of heart. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord, take and feel it. Feel it for thy course of If you have your Bibles with you today, please open them to the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua chapter 1. The book of Joshua chapter 1. One of the things that I often think about in this work of theological education is that we are always dealing with the transition in leadership. That you are here knowing that the keys of the church are going to be turned over to you. That the future of leadership within the Southern Baptist Convention and across the kingdom of God in this world is one day going to be yours. That you are going to be the ones who set the pace. You are going to be the ones who write the books. You are going to be the ones who stand on the platforms and preach and teach. You are going to be the ones one day in the classroom, in the presidency, doing the things that your teachers, doing the things that I am doing right now. And we are engaged in a transition of leadership. Those transitions are very tricky and very precarious. Sometimes they can go very smoothly, and sometimes they don't. If you're a track fan, you know of a, one of the most famous events in track, the relay race. And the really critical thing in the relay race is not how fast the runners are, it's how smoothly they can hand off the baton. And the race will be determined... Not simply by who has the fastest four people running. The race is usually determined by how smoothly that baton is handed off. It can drop. I've seen that happen in very important races. It can fall to the ground and the race be completely lost. There can be a stumble. There can be a glitch. And the runners run, but they have no hope of winning because of the stumbling that occurred in the handoff. 
And so what we are doing in this process of continual transition that happens in the work of God's kingdom is extremely important. How is the handoff going to go with you? Now talk about your transitions. The book of Joshua is about a really big transition. Moses, the lawgiver, was dead. The leadership of the children of Israel. We know they must have been Baptists because they were so hard to work with. The leadership of the children of Israel was now going to Joshua. And Joshua was going to have the responsibility of taking them across the Jordan into the Promised Land. What a complicated task. Not only getting everybody set and organized, not only getting everybody across the river, not only driving out the inhabitants who were there and their work of driving out the inhabitants who were there was a part of God's judgment against their paganism and their sin, not only getting everybody a home and a place to live, but the people organized and creating literally a new nation. What a complicated task. For all those years, Joshua had been on the sideline. Forty years. That's a long time to wait for the senior pastor to retire. Forty years he had been watching Moses. Now we don't know nothing of Josh. We know nothing, excuse me, of Joshua's ambition. We don't have any idea if he ever dreamed of taking the place of Moses. We don't know if they talked about it from time to time. All we know is that when it came to the end, Joshua was the one God chose to follow Moses. And Joshua was a lot like me because the thought of it obviously scared him to death. I don't think you will find the admonition to take courage repeated more frequently anywhere in the Bible than in the book of Joshua. Over and over again, God reminds Joshua, be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid, be strong, be courageous, over and over again. Because Joshua, who had watched everything that happened, from leaving Egypt to standing there before the Jordan, knew how difficult a task lay ahead. He also knew how easy it was to fail. For Joshua was going to be leading the people into the promised land because Moses failed. You remember, don't you? At one point, when the people were out of water, God told Moses to strike the rock and water would come forth from the rock. Later on, when the people were out of water, God said to Moses, speak to the rock. And instead, Moses, in his anger and frustration with the continual grumbling of those first Baptist Jews, in his anger, Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And that act of disobedience cost Moses the promised land. All those years of leadership in the desert, all the challenges of that titanic battle between God and Pharaoh when Moses was the man in the middle, and the culmination of it all was the privilege of leading the people into the promised land, and Moses lost it. Because of his temper. Joshua knew how hard the people were to lead. And Joshua knew how easy it was to fail as a leader. I wonder if you've come to grips with that. And what that knowledge has done to you. One thing that concerns me is I hear some of today's generation of students talking about how difficult the church is and Therefore, they don't ever want to have to mess with a body of deacons. They don't want to have to put up with those family-run churches. They don't want to have to deal with all the bureaucracy. And they think that if they can just go and start a church from scratch, they won't have those problems. You could get great work as a stand-up comedian. A lot of people are very concerned about the state of the church. And they think its challenges mean it's not a very good opportunity. That it may be real hard. And they want to look for something with greater potential. I want you to think what that says about your understanding of your call. Your understanding of the power of God. 
Your understanding of the permanence of the church, Jesus died to establish. I want you to think of what that says. Because through every age of the church, the church has always been tough to lead. The church has always been difficult. And one of the really interesting things is when you get to know the pastors of truly great churches who stand on the platform and tell you the story, who see incredible things happening in their ministry, they never have time to tell you all of the story and the scars that they picked up along the way and the heartache and the heartbreak that they had along the way. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, somebody else already has the easy ministries and you're stuck with the tough ones. That's the reality. Joshua knew how hard the people were to lead and Joshua knew how easy it was for a leader to fail. Have you understood that yet about yourself? Do you know the razor edge that you are walking on as one that God has called to be His servant in the church and the world today? That it is easy to fail. Do you realize that if you lose control of your emotions and your temper, like Moses, you could find it impossible to ever step into the promised land of a great and fruitful ministry. I can list the names of people whose temper has cost them in ministry. Do you know that your failure to walk with God could one day result in you becoming an embarrassment to the kingdom of God? I can give you the names of people who sat exactly where you're sitting, who saw before them a productive life of ministry only to lose their intimacy with God and become involved in immorality and sin. And no one ever sat here and dreamed, one day I hope I can commit adultery and lose my family and my ministry. No one's ever dreamed that here. It is easy to fail. It is easier than you realize to fail. And here was Joshua At a crowning moment. What an exciting time. God has chosen you out of all the children of Israel to follow a man who remains all these centuries later one of the greatest people in the history of the world, one of the most influential people in the history of the world. You're the guy who gets to follow Moses. What an honor. What an incredibly exciting day. And it terrified Joshua to the core of his soul. We could do with a little holy terror to understand how significant is the task that God has given us. For you literally will be one day in my place, in the place of all the great leaders in the kingdom of God. They will not be here any longer. It will be yours. And all the challenges that the church is facing and all the difficulties that come with working to expand the influence of the kingdom of God in the world and the costliness of obedience in going to the mission field or going to start a church from scratch or going to a dead old county seat town or whatever God may have for you. All the costliness of ministry is going to come and will be your bill to pay. And whether you're a pastor or a counselor or a teacher or a singer, whatever you may be, the difficulty of being the man on the point will one day be yours. And the question is, are you ready for that transition? Are you going to face it with a sense of confidence or with a sense of dread? 
Are you going to be looking for the least difficult ministry? Or are you going to be looking for a perfect understanding of what God wants you to do? That's going to be a defining moment in your character. Joshua said yes. Knowing how difficult it was for the people to lead, knowing that he would forever be compared to Moses, knowing how easy it was to fail, and that his great mentor, as great as he was, lost the privilege of setting foot in the promised land because of his failure. Joshua said yes. Now, because it is such an incredible time of transition, and because you see the sobering realities that face Joshua, it is fascinating to me what God emphasized in his transition. If you were God, what would you say to Joshua? If you were God, what would be your major message to him as he began his leadership role. I want to call your attention to one verse that is, I think, the heart of what God said to Joshua. It's a verse that has become one of my favorites in all the Bible. I never worked so hard to learn a single verse of the Bible as I did this one. Because for my English, it's very awkwardly stated but it has become very precious to me. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, so that you might observe to do according to everything that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. The major responsibility that Joshua was going to have on his watch was to be a military leader. That was the demand of the moment. And he was going to spend most of the years of his leadership as a military commander. But God's word to him was not a word about military strategy. It was a word about the importance of Scripture, memory, and meditation. I like to call that the M&M diet, and I think every believer ought to be on an M&M diet. Not the candy, but Scripture memory and meditation. God's deepest admonition to Joshua was that if he would give himself, without reservation, completely to the Word of God, everything else would take care of itself. If he would give himself completely, and without reservation to his personal consumption of and understanding of the Word of God, everything else would take care of itself. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Now, you may think that indicates we really shouldn't speak the Bible uh, until we understand it or something like that. But it's not talking about that. You could see a reference to this in the admonitions given to kings Uh, In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 19, they were to fill their mouth with the Word of God. They were to not simply read, they were also to speak the Word of God, to keep the Word of God continually in their conversation. There was never to be a moment when the Word of God was not in your mouth. That's what God is saying to Joshua. It is to become a part of the warp and woof of who you are. And the people who are around you, if they are around you, they will hear and know the Word of God. It will be constantly coming from you. This book of the law will not depart out of your mouth. You will immerse yourself in it. You will hide it in your heart. You will make it a part of your soul. In other words, you will memorize. God's Word and have it so much a part of you, it is never away from you. The only Bible you really have is the one that you have in your mind and in your heart. 
Have you ever sat down with a piece of paper and just started trying to write out the Bible verses you know? Or sat down before your computer and assumed if something happened to you that has happened to believers in the past, you would be able to reconstruct the Bible? When many of our brave pilots in the Vietnam War were shot down, they literally kept their sanity in POW camps by trying to recall all the Bible that they could recall. If suddenly the Bible were taken away from you and you could not have a written copy of the Word of God and you were to be leading a church or a group of disciples, could you disciple them from the whole counsel of God? Or would you be limited to John 3.16? I love John 3.16, but God did say a few other things too. How much of the Word of God have you made a part of your heart and soul and life? I am very blessed. I grew up in a church and a Christian family. So all of my life, I had the opportunity to be exposed to the Word of God. I am very blessed. We were not just a Christian family. My parents were active, dedicated Christians. And they encouraged us to memorize the Word of God. And one of the rites of passage in our family, every child, was the Christmas that you could quote from memory, the Christmas story, as a part of our Christmas Eve gathering as a family. And they would always encourage us to memorize verses of the Bible. And we would sit around the table at dinner many times and we would quote verses of the Bible. I am very blessed. I had Sunday school teachers who, who taught us children to learn the Word of God. God's telephone number, Jeremiah 33, 33, call unto me, 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which you do not know. All sorts of little things like that. I had Sunday school teachers who tried to make Scripture memory interesting and fun for children. But not all of you had that. Some of you did not come to Christ until you are in college or young adult. And you've never been around anyone who really encouraged you to hide the Word of God in your heart. Well, folks, if you've never been around anyone, let me be the first. This is important. This really does matter. The Bible that you have and are best able to use is the one that you have stored in your heart and soul. For there will be times when you will not have an opportunity to go to a concordance and look up a verse. There will be times when you will not even have the Bible with you. You will have to simply speak from the Word of God. My very first mission trip was to, a second mission trip, first one as a married uh, man. My wife and I went to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia with a group of college students. And I was on the staff of the BSU at Baylor. And we were all over the place. One, of the, one day while we were there, the missionary came and said, we're going to smuggle you into a school, an Islamic school. And we've got some believers in there who are going to gather some of their classmates. This was a high school. They're going to gather some of their classmates in a room. We're going to smuggle you in at midnight. And we're going to let you speak very softly and explain the gospel to them. We couldn't turn on a light. It's one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had. We were in a room that was jam-packed with people. There were probably 50 or 60 people crowded in this room. There was not a light on. I couldn't see anybody's face. I couldn't even see my own hand. And there I was asked to explain to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I couldn't refer to the Bible. I couldn't refer to notes. All I had is what was here. Would you be ready for an opportunity like that? They didn't give me a lot of notice that that was going to happen. It happened very quickly. No time to memorize then. No time to learn then. What you've got, you can use. What you don't have, can't be used. How much of the Word of God are you filling your life with? Are you working on any Scripture memory project? One of the things that got me started afresh happened when I was in college. I had a Bible from my growing up scripture memory as a child in First Baptist Church of Beaumont, Texas. But I started a second Bible when I was a college student, building upon that first memorized Bible. But we had a BSU program that emphasized scripture memory. And I was challenged one day to do the Navigator's topical memory system. They're a little verse pack 
uh, verses on all sorts of different topics. And I began to memorize that topical memory system of the navigators. That's what led me to Joshua 1, 8. I thought I would never memorize it. All the verses were in King James uh, at that time. It was very difficult for me to learn. I was using my own Bible. was the New American Standard Bible. It's always been my Bible from college day forward. And that was such a hard verse to learn. But I began hiding those verses in my heart. And then when I became a seminary student, I started to get interested in learning passages of the Bible and sections of the Bible. My project this year, I'm working on learning the Sermon on the Mount and getting that inside my heart and life. God wants you to be so full of the Word of God, it is literally coming out of your mouth all the time. Sometimes in direct quotation, sometimes in influence of things you say, but nothing you say does not reflect the Word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. It's not enough to simply learn the words. You have to learn the meaning of the words and the Holy Spirit's application to those words. Now, whenever we think meditation here in our day and time, we often think of meditation as coming from Eastern philosophy or religion, the New Age movement. Meditation means you sit in the corner with your legs crossed and go, um, and try to empty your mind of everything. That's the Eastern concept of meditation. For if you can only empty your mind of everything, you will find true insight. Biblical meditation is something quite different. Biblical meditation is not emptying your mind, it's filling your mind with the Word of God. Turning it over and over in your heart and asking God, what are you saying to me in this verse, in this passage? It is dwelling on the Word of God. Now, when's the last time somebody would think you were camped out on a Bible verse or a Bible text? That you were literally living in it. Every moment possible. Asking the Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? That's meditation. Scripture memory combined with meditation, is the Holy Spirit's classroom for shaping your character and making you a woman of God, a man of God. That's how God builds His children. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate therein day and night. Why? So that you might observe to do according to everything that is written therein. The goal of Scripture, memory, and meditation is obedience to God's will and God's ways. It's not information that God wants you to get. It's the behavior of obedience that is the ultimate aim of the Lord. How are you going to develop into an obedient Christian? It is going to be the result of Scripture memory and meditation. Have you learned this about the way you're wired up as a human being? Have you learned that when you really focus on not doing things, you tend to do them? Have you learned that? I mean, just think all day, I'm not going to eat a chocolate bar. Just think about it all day long. I am not going to eat a chocolate bar. You know that white chocolate that My wife bought when we were coming through the airport in Paris two weeks ago that's sitting there unopened there in our home that that really does. It's my favorite chocolate. I'm not going to eat that bar of white chocolate today. I'm not going to eat the whole thing. Now, maybe a little bit of it, but I'm not going to eat the whole thing. Have you ever noticed how you're what The things that you think you're not going to do, the more you think about not doing them, the more likely you are to do them. And so somebody who's wrestling with the problem with Internet pornography thinks, I'm not going to do pornography anymore. Or somebody who's wrestling with the problem of witnessing says, I'm not going to be afraid to witness anymore. Or somebody who's wrestling with this problem, that problem. You fill your mind with what you're not going to do and you're actually reinforcing the doing of what you don't want to do. God has a different way. Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11. 
How shall a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Rather than trying to avoid sin, seek righteousness. That's God's way. That's how God will make you pure and keep you pure. That's how God will make you a woman of integrity. That's how God will make you a man who will refuse to cheat on assignments and classes. That's how God will teach you His ways and His Word and His will. When you focus on the positive, what God wants you to do, by filling your mind with His Word and meditating on His Word, what happens is that the Word of God changes your desires internally, which eventually results in changing your behavior externally. May I say that again? What God is up to is changing your desires internally because that will eventually result in changing your behavior externally. As you get the Word of God in your heart and your mind and you begin to feast on that Word of God and meditate on that Word of God, God will give you the desires of His heart. You begin to want the things that God wants. You begin to desire the lifestyle that He desires for you. You will find yourself longing for His agenda. And obedience becomes the desire of your heart. Not something you have to try to force, but something internally that you want. That is how God shapes us. And the more attention that you give to getting the Word of God in your soul and meditating on the Word of God to make it a part of your life, the more like Him you will become. And there's no shortcut to that. I have a photographic memory, but I can't find a place to get the film developed. I don't know an easy way to memorize and meditate on the Word of God, but simply to do it one word, one phrase, one verse at a time. Let me show you the difference. I collect walking sticks, and I've got all kinds. Some very mean, cruel person gave this to me on my birthday. I won't tell you which birthday. And they were trying to make a statement about how old I was becoming. So it's my walking stick for the old geezer. Got a little horn to make people get out of my way as I'm shuffling along. A rear view mirror so I can see who's behind me. It's cute, isn't it? It's a cartoon, a caricature of what a walking stick really is. The wood is not very sturdy, very cheap quality. It's not even a real expensive horn. And it's hard to adjust the mirror. It's a cartoon of what a walking stick is. A walking stick is designed to support and help you move. This is designed to laugh at the fact that you need it. It's a cartoon. You should see this one. Solid wood. Very heavy. It was a sweet and precious gift from one of our students who has been a missionary in Ghana, in Africa. It was made by hand. And you can see the detail of the carving and the polishing that was done to bring out the grain of the wood. This is a work of art. It's a very good walking stick and will handle your weight anywhere. But it's more than that. It's the expression of a craftsman. And you could hold this up and say, if you want to know what kind of art and craft the people of Ghana can do, this will show you. 
Ghana. Americans. <laughs> Scripture memory and meditation allows God to slowly craft you into exactly what He wants you to be. It takes a whole lifetime. You can't learn God's Word in a day, a month, or a semester. It takes reading it over and over and over again. It takes time to really let it soak into your soul so you begin to understand it. But when God's Word begins to have its effect, God cuts away everything that isn't a part of His design. And He polishes and smooths everything that He is. And He will make you a work of art. A work of what He always intended a man to be or a woman to be. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night so that you might observe to do according to everything that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good effect. It's not about financial prosperity. It's about bringing things to reality that are potential. It's about finishing the task. It's about being able to accomplish what God gives you to do. The odds were so against Joshua when he started. The people were incredibly difficult to lead. And it was incredibly easy for the leader to fail. But God kept saying, have courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's the determination to be obedient anyway. God admonished him to have courage. And he didn't give him a book of military tactics. He didn't give him a list of do's and don'ts of everything a leader does. He didn't write a bestseller on how to have a great organization as a leader. What he did was to say, fill your heart and mind with my word. And everything else will take care of itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the process of turning the kingdom of God and the world over to you. One day I will be nothing but a memory. And one day all of your faculty will be gone. And one day some of you in this room will probably be on the faculty. And one day one of you may be standing where I'm standing. It's going to be a harder, more complicated world. And the church is going to have some of the greatest problems it's ever had. We did all the easy stuff. We're going to leave the hard stuff for you. Will you have courage to accept whatever role in the kingdom God gives you to do? Will you do His one basic fundamental training for every kingdom leader. Will you fill your mind and heart with the Word of God? Not to be able to quote it and impress people, but to be able to let it cut away everything that isn't godly. Polish up everything that is and reveal you to be the handiwork of God Himself. I was writing my dissertation when the telephone rang. Our two schnauzers were laying on their backs with their feet in the air, sound asleep. Crumpled paper was all over the floor. I was sitting there staring at the piece of paper I was working on when the telephone shattered the silence. I went up and picked it up, 
and it was my predecessor, my seminary president, Dr. Landrum Level, saying, Chuck, I've just received a telephone call, and your father's had a heart attack, and he's in open heart surgery right now, and they don't know how it's going to turn out. And they have asked for you to get home as quickly as you can. world changed right then. I wasn't thinking about my dissertation. Called my wife at work. Told her what was happening and we decided on the phone that I needed to go immediately and that as soon as she could, probably that night, she would follow. Threw some clothes in a suitcase. Blue jeans for a hospital. A suit for a funeral. Didn't know which I would need. And I set off on a very long five-hour drive. This was before the day of cell phones. And I could not find out any more news than the simple fact that my dad was hovering between life and death at that moment. As the miles rolled, old words began to come. Fear thou not. For I am with thee. Be not afraid. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with the right hand of my righteousness. Haven't you heard? God, the Lord, the Creator, the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of His understanding. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He will increase their strength. Now, young men can fall. And the strongest young man can utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He who believeth in me shall never die. Verse after verse began flooding my mind as the miles rolled by. When I finally pulled in the parking lot of Baptist Hospital in Beaumont, Texas, stepped out of my car, did not know what was inside the doors of that hospital. But my soul had peace. And I was ready to stand with my mom and face whatever was there. Ladies and gentlemen, when that telephone rang, it was too late to add anything I didn't already have. And I was going to make it that day on the basis of what was in my life. Don't wait until the storm comes to be working on your foundation. You build your foundation now. You build it on the Word of God. You hide it in your heart. You turn it over in your mind. You set your will to do that which God puts in front of you. And you let the power of His Word change you from the inside out. And whatever that ringing telephone brings to your day, you'll be ready. Jesus put it this way. The winds come. And the rains come, and the foundation built on sand crumbles. The winds come, and the rains come, and the foundation built on the rock will stand. Are you ready to rock the world? Knowing how hard the people are to lead, and how easy is it to fail? Will you say yes to an incredible opportunity 
to be a leader in the kingdom of God. You can do it if you'll build your life on His Word. Join me for a word of prayer. Father, how we thank You for the gift of Your Word. It is simple. It is complex. It can be radiantly clear. It can be so difficult we struggle for days and longer. Yet Your Word, Father, in every age of Your people, Your Word has been sufficient. Father, we know from Your Word will come sound doctrine. We know also from Your Word will come a sure foundation. And I pray for every member of this faculty. And I pray for every student. I pray for every last one of us that we will acknowledge how hard the people are to lead and we will acknowledge how easy it is for a leader to fail. But we will with joy and confidence report for duty to whatever our kingdom task is when we have built our life on the sufficiency of Your Word. Get it not simply in our minds for tomorrow's test. Get it in our souls for tomorrow's challenges. In the precious and strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.